Well, thank you uh, to Michelle. Um, thank you to the uh, staff here at the gallery. Um, I was very pleased, first of all, to be invited by Michelle two years ago to do a show here and uh, to have the opportunity to work with um, two uh, museum collections, um, the Cord Museum and the Musée de Beaux-Arts. And um, so uh, Michelle uh, has been very patient, uh, waiting for the work <laughs> to be made. Um, because of uh, my schedule and so forth, even though the show has been sort of in, in process for two years, uh, conceptually, it's been evolving for two years and developing. Um, most of the work actually got made in the most recent few weeks. I don't want to say how many few weeks. But, um, so Michelle has been really great in terms of just uh, her, her faith in, in that the work would arrive um, and uh, for uh, really respecting the process uh, of, first of all, giving giving it the, the time it needs to develop and then to uh, create the work. So thank you to Michelle for that and also to the installation crew who did an amazing job on these tents, which were, as it turned out, a little more complicated than I thought they were going to be, but in the end they looked fabulous. So I was very happy with how the installation turned out. Um, I, I wanted to talk, uh, I think, uh, a bit sort of generally about my practice because I think um, sometimes uh, I forget that uh, some people are new to my work and they don't know anything about it. So I think I, uh, I got some interesting questions last night at the opening about uh, who this character was in my work and uh, is she male or female and you know what what is what is she? <laughs> so uh, I don't know if have any of you uh, been to any of my talks before because I don't want to bore you with the, so not too many people one or two done yeah. okay so. Um, I think I'll start with a sort of a general introduction and, and then kind of get into uh, uh, more specifics. But um, I kind of framing this uh, talk uh, about uh, mostly about uh, the work that I do with museums. And, and I think the, the responding to museums or working with museums or, or specific works in museums uh, is really a, a large part of my practice. Um, I've always been interested in museums. I love museums, and uh, I, I also, as I've you know been creating work, I've, I've been kind of critical of museums at the same time because uh, often they're they're uh, they move very slowly in terms of their ability to respond to um, you know how culture evolves, and uh, I've also been critical of museums in terms of how they represent Aboriginal people. So I've kind of. Uh, <coughs> You know, uh, taking them to task a few times about uh, the, the representation of, of, of art history and how they uh, have represented Aboriginal people. So, as we go through, I'll get more specific. Um, this is a painting by Albert Bierstadt, and I, I really became interested in it specifically in the history of North American uh, uh, painting as it related to conquest, this idea of colonization, how the Europeans were. Um, documenting their experience in North America, and also how they looked at uh, Aboriginal people. So this is, uh, for instance, a, a, a painting um, by uh, another artist from the 19th century, and it's Daniel Boone's first view of the Kentucky Valley. And um, this was a, a, a kind of a, a, a great starting point for me, because it really just said so much about you know, the European eye on the land this idea of possession and, and um, the taking of the land. Other themes that sort of came through as I kind of dug through our history were these uh, ideas of uh, Native people as sexual predators. Um, so uh, pretty soon I started to develop themes in my work that had to do with uh, sexuality, colonized sexuality, the power dynamics within sexuality, and using these as metaphors to talk about these larger discourses power. Um, so as you can see, the, uh, the sort of the, the, the themes of sexuality, this is uh, the rape of uh, Daniel Boone's daughter by the Indians. And this is my version, which is called uh, the rape of Daniel Boone Jr. <laughs> so um, 
as my work uh, uh, developed, um, I started to look more closely at the work of the individual artists um, and to, to really s start to unpack, you know, to, to think about who these people were, like who, who were these artists and, and, and why were they making these images in the first place. And uh, of course the frontier was this place of uh, sort of unknown venture and uh, um, so some of them, uh, like this gentleman here, John McStanley, painted himself into his work um, uh, as a kind of, you know, macho uh, explorer, you know, he's hunting uh, bison. So, um, and then George Catlin. Now George Catlin has been described recently by a curator as my nemesis, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of true. Uh, but I found a lot of inspiration in George Catlin, and, and I, you know, I've come, I've, I've sort of encountered some uh, resistance at different museums because they really think I'm being hard on these artists. But in actual fact, I, I find them fascinating. I find their work fascinating, and um, so often I'm approaching their work with a, with a great deal of respect, as much as I am being critical of their work. But this is George Catlin, who uh, painted himself making a portrait of uh, an Indian chief, and um, so. Fairly soon into uh, creating this uh, body of work, I realized that I also had to sort of place myself in the work as the artist and sort of uh, ch uh, sort of rival the ego of, of these artists who were painting themselves into the work. So I created a, a character. Now the character I created was based on um, uh, uh, the tradition of uh, two-spirited people who lived in North America who were um, living in the uh, opposite gender. So men who lived as women and and women who lived as men, it's something I think still, uh, I find, I'm, I'm always surprised that people have never heard of it. Um, I had some questions last night about that, and um, I'm always delighted to sort of, you know, bring people uh, to this information that um, there was sexual variance and plural sexualities present in North America before the, you know, before Europeans arrived. And, so my work is uh, uh, often about that point of contact and that point of uh, maybe confusion or complication uh, of misunderstanding and um, uh, uh, meeting with uh, new, uh, new ways of seeing the world. And, um, so the French uh, referred to this person as uh, the Berdash, and the Berdash is a word that became uh, sort of offensive to, to Aboriginal people. Um, because it was based on an Arabic word for the male concubine, Bardach. But I still use Bardach, I, I kind of like it, I, I like the idea of the male concubine. So, um, but uh, in, in, in the different tribes there's uh, words for, different words for th these special people who, who really had special roles in um, tribal societies. And this is a, a very famous uh, Bardash, uh, Wewa was her name, and um, she was Zuni, and um, actually re represented her, her, her nation of people in Washington, and uh, um, you know, met the president and so forth, and um, so had a really outstanding position in, in her nation as a uh, female, but not biologically male. So Catlin made this one painting, this the one painting that I was able to find, in, where he actually painted the Berdash, and it's called Dance to the Berdash, and I've created a number of works based on this painting, and I'll bring this image back up uh, uh, as it relates to the different uh, works that I've created, but I, I've just found lots of inspiration in this image because, uh, because it, it is the celebratory dance, it's an honor dance to this um, person who, uh, and as Catelyn described in his journals, this would happen once or twice a year, or as many times as they sort of felt like it. This is in the Sac and Fox tribe, so it was a way for the men who had had relations with this Beardash to sort of celebrate them, and basically uh, uh, had some fun, because it seemed to be a, 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 an experience that was filled with humor and uh, kind of gentle teasing. Now, in Catlin's journal, you know, as, he, and, and, as he's describing it as this sort of curious, uh, um, kind of uh, part of the culture, he, he at the same time wishes that it, it should be extinguished forever because he, kind of, he finds it disgusting. 
So for that reason, I find Catlin really, you know, uh, fascinating. He's, he's the, sort of a man of contradictions. You know, on one hand, he purports to be this documentarian, kind of objective, and then can't help but he, you know places cultural bias, uh, which really indicates the, the sexual mores of, of the time, um, onto this scene. So here's the, the beginning, the emergence of, of Miss Chief, uh, Eagle Testicle. She's the alter ego, my alter ego, that I created to inhabit the work and to kind of live in the 19th century. And she does time travel. She sort of shifts back and forth, but she became the artistic persona uh, who kind of uh, reverses the gaze and her subject uh, became the European male. So using the dynamic of the artist and the model, uh, was able to sort of uh, reverse uh, the perspective and to talk about uh, these you know, power relationships, the power of the artist to create the image, the power of the image. So for her look, of course, I went straight to Cher. <laughs> Cher had her half-breed, uh, which was so glamorous, and it was kind of gender-bending at the same time, so I thought that was sort of a, this really kind of interesting cultural as well as uh, gender cross-dressing. Um, but Cher certainly wasn't the first. There was Molly Spotted Elk, who I also sort of came across, uh, who um, was a Penobscot woman who was um, dancing in, in Paris in these uh, female review shows in the early 20th century. So here she is, Miss Chief, and she's got her, her cowboy, Saint Sebastian, and she's uh, piercing him with arrows, and at the same time she's uh, painting his picture. Um, so Miss Chief has, you know, since that time, she's kind of rampaging through art history and uh, um, having her way with various uh, European males, some of them famous historical characters and others are just sort of these generic cowboys with great bottoms. Um, so at, at, at a point, um, I realized that I'd created this character and, and, and there was almost a, a a necessity to bring her to life as a, as, a, as a performance character. And I had never done performance before, but it just seemed like a logical extension of where the work was going. And um, so this is 2004, and I was invited by the McMichael Canadian Art Collection, which is this uh, the spiritual home of the Group of Seven, as they call themselves. It's, in, it's in just outside of Toronto. And they are this sort of... Uh, it was again as a, a, a private collection and then uh, became uh, government funded, but ultimately it was this sacred place for the group of seven uh, to, you know, for them to, to maintain this collection by the McMichaels. And they did some programming, some contemporary programming, they collect, started to collect, collect some Aboriginal artwork and so forth. But in the 90s, the, the politics changed in, in Ontario and the McMichaels didn't like the fact that their uh, museum was becoming kind of progressive. They really uh, opposed the idea that um, the museum should collect contemporary Aboriginal art. They, they really felt that Aboriginal art in their minds and that art in general was really something that uh, was very specific and time-based. So um, at the, by the point that, uh, that I had the opportunity to do an artist in residence, um, already all the programming had been pretty much locked down by the McMichaels through their lawyers uh, on the board. Uh, the contemporary curators had pretty much had to um, even start deaccessioning work that had already been purchased. And uh, two friends of mine, Aboriginal artists, Michael Belmore and Marianne Barkhouse, uh, had their artwork removed from the premises and put out by the dumpster. So I went into the situation with a little chip on my shoulder <laughs> about the McMichael. And uh, so I toured, there was, there was one window uh, available in the programming of the, of the institution, which was the artist in residence program uh, on the weekend, which I guess most artists would just sort of set up their easel in this little uh, cottage and paint with people would come and watch them paint. So I decided to uh, kind of uh, use this opportunity to uh, do something a little more outrageous. Um, and uh, so I got a tour through the gallery before the weekend, and uh, of course you see all the group of seven paintings, and then the First Nations gallery. So right away I knew I had some material to work with because uh, there were the totem poles and masks and all the things that you would sort of 
traditionally would associate with the First Nations Gallery. But then there was this film by Edward Curtis. Now, Edward Curtis, 19th century, early 20th century uh, filmmaker, photographer, was very well known for his romantic portrayals and also for his contrivance in terms of how he would set up his subjects and often um, posing them with uh, in their ceremonial clothes when they were doing menial things like cooking. So it, he was kind of known for his, uh, uh, well, let's say for the profound subjectivity, or his heavy hand, I guess, in, his, in creating these images, very romantic images, which are still enduring and loved by everyone, including Aboriginal people. But so here was this film being shown, again, as this sort of European voice of authority on Aboriginal people. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. If I, maybe I should make a, a film. So, um, so it began with this performance piece, which was called The Taxonomy of the European Male, in which Miss Chief uh, finds these boys uh, and turns and dresses them up to look more European or to look more authentic. And she has one of them play the harpsichord, and she's sort of... Uh, conducting the scene from her easel as she has them stripped down almost naked and then dresses them up to look more authentic um, in their period gear. And all the while she's reciting text from Catlin's journal and Paul Kane's journal, which uh, makes these broad uh, sweeping generalizations about whole nations of people in terms of their posture and stature and so forth. Uh, basically, I, uh, this is at Compton Burney in England, uh, and I was invited to participate in a group show there. Um, um, but let me back up just before I get that. Uh, now, on the monitor um, that's sort of in the little vestibule there by the front desk, there are three films uh, screening there. They're not really part of the show, but it's uh, previous work. And uh, so I'll just sort of allow you to see those films. But one of those films was shot at the McMichael the same day that I did the, the performance uh, there. And it's called The Group of Seven Inches. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, the cinematic sort of version of uh, the live performance in which she sort of locates these uh, European males uh, in the woods of the McMichael. And, um, takes them back to Tom Thompson's shack where she sort of has her way with them, plies them with alcohol, and uh, paints their portrait. And um, so that was shot the same day, which was like this hot August day in, in, in Ontario. So it must have been about 34 degrees or more with the humidity. So we were just, you know, packed into this Tom Thompson shack. And uh, anyway, Tom Thompson's shack was actually relocated to the McMichael and, and sits, sits permanently installed there as this kind of museum piece where it's set up with his easel or you know stuff that's supposed to be his his studio. And there's windows in the, the, the room where, where you know the audience can come and sort of look in and and, and uh, see his studio. So while we were in there filming this young family <laughs> and uh, peered through the, the glass window and saw, sort of saw this debauchery going on in, <laughs> in, inside the, the shack. So that was kind of this moment that happens in the film where, where it kind of does descend into some sort of hysterics and we, we captured it on film. But it was a great exercise uh, for me as a filmmaker to kind of uh, liberate my process because I'd made films in a much more conventional way and that group of seven inches was really uh, a kind of uh, an experiment to, to have a more guerrilla style approach to filming. We had like three or four Super 8 cameras and we were just shooting everything, no sync sound. And it really liberated my process as a filmmaker. And the, the, the other two films that are on this reel uh, that you'll see uh, followed. So uh, shooting Geronimo, uh, again, was all shot with Super 8. So, um, I just want to show you a, a little clip from this. Passing through Sherwood Forest on horseback in a marathon and exhaustive taxonomy of the European male. We have an eager audience of 200 or more who have gathered here on the spectacular grounds of this historic museum in the expectation of catching a glimpse of mischief in the pursuit of some European males. <laughs> The atmosphere here on this beautiful June evening is charged with excitement.
as we await the imminent arrival of the Miss Chief Eagle Test Club. And there she is, ladies and gentlemen. Miss Chief is making her way along the gravel path that leads from Sherwood Forest onto the grounds of Compton Verney. Compton Verney is a stunning 17th century manor house designed by Robert Adams with landscaping by Capability Brown. Miss Chief is pausing, holding her steed, a stunning English thoroughbred. Normally she rides bareback, but she's quite adaptable to both Western and English saddles. Not sure what the reason is for the pause here. Oh, wait. I think she's possibly spotted her subject. Let's see if we can catch a glimpse of what she's seeing. Ah, oh, yes, she has two European males in her sights who are now making their way across the green, sprinting rather, hoping to beat Mischief to the archery target. Not likely that they will beat her at this game, however, as she crushed both Cannon and Delacroix and bows and arrows. However, ladies and gentlemen, it looks as though Mischief has not just found any European males here today. I believe she has stumbled across Robin Hood himself and his partner, Friar Tuck. How thrilling and unexpected. This should indeed be an interesting encounter. I'm very pleased to be bringing this rare moment to you live on television, ladies and gentlemen. However, I'm not entirely sure if Mischief knows what she's in for. On my arrival here, in Europe, from the continent of North America, where I've already passed considerable time in studying the customs and manners of the European male, I've determined to devote whatever talents and proficiencies I possess to the painting of a series of pictures illustrative of the European male in his native habitat. The subject is one that I've felt a deep interest since childhood, having become intimately familiar in my native land with many hundreds of trappers, voyageurs, priests, and farmers who represent the noblest races of Europe. But alas, the face of the white man is changing. All traces of his former self are being altered through contact with the red man. And those who wish to study <coughs> the splendor of the European male must travel far and wide to find him. Despite the authority with which she commands herself in any forest of countries like the North American soil, she does not have the home turf advantage here. Needless to say, Robin Hood is not, and never has been, a fair player. And despite his seemingly innocent and boyish charm, he is in fact Thus, quite dangerous. It has become my undertaking to record all manner of his customs and practices before they are obliterated completely. As I trust that my pictures will hold not only an interest for the curious, but be able to choose value to his story. So it goes on, she continues, she takes them inside and uh, sort of uh, starts painting them and then the piece ends with them sort of attacking her and stealing her Louis Vuitton quiver and Louis Vuitton bag and they run outside and steal her horse <laughs> and ride off her horse and then she ends up sort of chasing them across the green. Um, so uh, Robin's Hood uh, was the um, uh, cinematic version that I ended up uh, shooting as a Super 8 film um, uh, during the same day. So it was a kind of a very long day. We shot the, we did the film in the morning and the performance at night, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was fun to have the museum kind of as a free location. So I started to think you know, a, a, about these uh, museum um, interventions as opportunities 
to uh, also uh, make films. Uh, in addition to the live performances, um, I was able to uh, kind of you know get a free location. And as a as a filmmaker, um, you can't really uh, uh, underestimate the value of um, you know getting a location like that for free. Plus all of the staff, the ground staff, and it was kind of like part of my crew. So. Uh, I was able to do that at McMichael and at Compton Burney and um, really got a lot of uh, bang for my few dollars uh, for these Super 8 films. So um, back to the paintings, um, again it's like uh, uh, mischief uh, as this character who is um, I guess uh, rampaging through history as I say. and. In this case, there's a trilogy of paintings in which I created a fictitious romance with her and um, uh, Thomas Scott, who uh, was uh, the uh, Protestant orange man from Ontario who resisted Louis Riel, and uh, Louis Riel had him executed, and ultimately this sort of precipitated the, um, the backlash of the Canadian uh, government, um, and of course changed the course of history in Manitoba. So um, this is called the Fourth of March, and it's day on which uh, Thomas Scott was executed and Miss Chief is, uh, sorry I don't know what's going on here, but uh, she's present, she's um, kind of upstaging the event, with a fainting or something. <laughs> um, and this is the sort of the scene at the end of the trilogy, uh, which is a scene of, uh, uh, actually I'm going to find slides, let's see if that'll, uh, it's, it's a scene of romantic grief, I guess you could say, so there's this idea of also reversing the grief. Um, so many artists of that period were convinced, like Catlin and others, that uh, the, um, the North American Indian was uh, a dying race, um, that they were vanishing, and, and, and this idea really proliferated in their art and their writings, and it was a way of extinguishing and making uh, Native people irrelevant. So a lot of my work, of course, at, uh, challenges that tenet as well, um, in terms of um, you know, defying that and saying, no, of course, you know, continue to be dynamic, uh, forward-moving cultures, uh, just not in the same form that, that we were when um, contact happened. And, and Catlin and Curtis were kind of obsessed with this idea of creating images of ab Aboriginal people that were uh, without European contamination, as they called it. So any Aboriginal people or Native people that showed any uh, <coughs> evidence of European contact, whether it was a top hat or an umbrella, uh, they would lance that from their from their view, uh, take it up, remove it from their from their paintings, or remove it from their pictures. So I've created uh, work that that deals specifically with that very narrow idea and this time capsule idea, and this really brings it, brings me back to the Michael and this time capsule idea of how. Native people are represented inside museums and through art history. And um, so, you know, I've worked kind of with different images from art history, borrowing from Jerome here, and his, the, the Pygmalion myth of the artist kind of falling in love with his sculpture, which is a stone sculpture, which but also is kind of coming to life. So there's this breath of life that's sort of coming from the dead. And, um, uh, uh, you know, artists like Catlin amass this huge uh, wealth of many, many, many thousands of artifacts and things that they took from different cultures and to kind of create, you know, these museums uh, of, of cultures that were of the past. This is Trapper's Men, which is at uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts here in Montreal, and um, this was a painting that I, I kind of put some of these key players, like Curtis, into the painting and Catlin um, to talk about, you know, how we see the world. Uh, this, uh, how we interpret the world around us, specifically, uh, you know, the natural world. Um, so here you have this painting by Albert Bierstadt, who, who represented it in this sort of you know, 19th century romantic idiom. Um, and you have uh, Curtis here, who's kind of staging his uh, native studs here with their CBC wigs, getting them to look all hot. Um, and uh, I put Pollock and Mondrian in here because Mondrian and Pollock were, were you know, from a modernist tradition, which, you know, the whole uh, vocabulary of painting was already starting to be unpacked. And uh, Mondrian was inspired, you know, by landscape. 
And Pollock was inspired by Native American art, um, sand painting, actually. So here he, he's kind of, they're both having their epiphany, and Miss Chief is this, she's got her blonde wig on, she's kind of like this Venus uh, apparition. Um, and Catelyn is, is present as well, taking notes uh, in his journal there on this winter camp, which is uh, the Lakota way of painting history. And uh, the bison robe uh, is the canvas. So I've used these bison robes as canvases as, uh, to kind of talk about how um, you know, Native people have used uh, or have a, you know, our own way of painting history and recording history. And a lot of that is oral history, but through these uh, devices of uh, these images, uh, it's a way of triggering long stories. And this, this uh, winter count actually was copied from uh, Lone Dog's winter count, which tells a whole hundred years of history in, in, on that one rope, um, which incidentally includes the battle of, uh, the, the defeat of Custer. Um, but, uh, but actually, it, it's during that period of, uh, uh, of time, but it's, it's not actually mentioned in that row because they didn't think it was uh, worthy of uh, putting onto their, their tribal history. But it's such a momentous sort of moment in American history, so I was really interested in how you know, we choose to, to, to build our, our, our mythology and how very different it is um, uh, from outside the Aboriginal culture. Lewis and Clark are in this painting as well, um, consulting their maps. And uh, Mackenzie is there trying to figure out how to use his sextant. So this is a, a, a painting that I did again. Now this was the, kind of the beginning of my touring show, which uh, was called The Triumph of Mischief. And, and because it was um, going to be uh, at some museums uh, across the country, I tried wherever possible to engage with museum collections to see what they had in their, in their collection, uh, to find inspiration to create works for that touring show. Um, so um, uh, this is called The Triumph of Mischief, and um, uh, it, it, it was a response to this painting that uh, is in, it's a terrible reproduction, sorry about that, but it's uh, by uh, Gustave Doré. It's called The Triumph of Christianity Over Paganism. And um, all of these beautiful blonde angels are, are sending all of these beautiful sort of heathens to hell. So um, I was just kind of taken with the, the painting and uh, decided to make, uh, uh, kind of combine my interest in this painting to make the, the, the triumph of mischief, which is the, really a celebration of uh, homosexuality uh, and um, to bring different characters from art history, um, from kind of Greek and Roman um, mythologies into this uh, dance or celebration of uh, the central uh, Verdash uh, character, which is of course played by Miss Chief herself. And I introduced, of course, Lewis and Clark uh, are in this, and they're being sort of mauled or manhandled by this bear, <laughs> this giant grizzly bear. And um, that kind of was a, um, inspired by um, an essay written by Vine Deloria uh, Jr., who, who, who um, had read Lewis and Clark's journals as they passed through um, the, the Midwest they encountered so many grizzly bears that it seemed like this unbelievable number of grizzly bears. But Vine Deloria uh, maintained that they were probably uh, helped through that territory by the, the, the bear medicine men who called the spirit of the, the bears to sort of push them through. So this for me is a way of you know, inserting a, a, a native way, an aboriginal view on history, which really is rooted in uh, aboriginal worldview or cosmology. And these bear medicine men, uh, what they would do is if they wanted to use the or call on the bear spirit, they would make them out of figurines out of clay. And the clay figurines, and this was actually documented by a, a European explorer that he witnessed these medicine men making these figurines for to help with the buffalo hunt. And the clay figurines he saw came to life. They helped chase the, the bison and 
and this whole thing sort of happened as an act of magic, but it was um, something that uh, that Vine Deloria maintains was likely used to sort of usher Lewis and Clark through that, that area. So the, the, all the little clay uh, figurines there are the bears uh, sort of running through the scene. And I was picking on Picasso a little bit here as well. Uh, the arrangement of the figures there is from Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. And uh, Picasso, of course, and other modernists were, were, were known for kind of pillaging primitive cultures and uh, borrowing heavily inspiration from oceanic cultures and so forth. So Miss Cheek has kind of taken him to task on that. She has her own winter count there, which is uh, you look really closely, you can see they're really drawings of her and her various exploits. Various mythological characters. And here on the um, far right, uh, we have George Catlin himself mm -hmm. and Paul Kane. And um, George Catlin made this painting of this one character. And he kind of used this painting, these things, uh, with John John. This man who went to Washington and came back to his people all decked out in these clothes. Um, and uh, Catlin used him as this example of, and of course he told stories to his people about Washington and the large buildings, the young people, and they didn't believe him and he was sort of sh shunned by his people. So Catlin used him as this example, uh, this sort of kind of a moral lesson on the, the, the demise of native people should they become contaminated with European culture. So um, he made a sort of the before portrait and the after portrait of this, of this guy. So this is a painting by uh, Paul Kane uh, called Medicine Mask Dance. And um, this was a piece that I um, had the opportunity to respond to uh, when I was invited to be in, in a show at the Royal Ontario Museum a couple of years ago with Shapeshifters. And uh, it was curated by two Aboriginal two young Aboriginal curators, and it was a show of contemporary Aboriginal art in the museum, and they encouraged us to go into the museum. Was there anything in the collection, was there anything about the museum that you uh, find of interest that you want to you know, speak to? Uh, well, of course, I went straight to the First Peoples Gallery, because I knew that Paul Kane uh, was hanging there. Again, this sort of voice of authority in the Aboriginal gallery. His paintings are everywhere, along with the masks and various things. So I thought, well, this, this painting, uh, you know, let's talk about this painting, because this painting is kind of the classic example of Paul Kane's uh, uh, artistic license. Um, and I wanted to talk about his artistic license. And um, so all these masks are from different nations, and he's combined them all into this medicine mask dance, which doesn't exist. And uh, I thought, well, let's talk about that. You know, I'll respond to that. So what I proposed was that I would make a painting and I would, I would hang it in the First Peoples Gallery next to Paul Kane's uh, painting. And uh, so I didn't think much of it. I wrote a one page precy and sent it off to the curator and they forwarded it to the director of the First Peoples Gallery who uh, responded immediately with a, a decisive no. You cannot allow Kent to uh, show this painting in the First Peoples Gallery. Um, we have a problem with him representing the masks. <laughs> so, I have to consult our Niska elder because we don't find that that's appropriate to have him representing the masks. And I thought, all right, that's kind of interesting. And uh, so they sort of generated this conversation between the curators and the curator of the, the First Peoples Gallery and myself. And, and then uh, when that argument didn't work, he sort of backpedaled a little more and uh, eventually he just said, we can't have Kent challenge the authority of Paul Kane, basically. We can't have him in introduce this doubt about his work to our audience. So I was censored from the per First People's Gallery at, at the Royal Interior Museum and um, in the end, he agreed to allow the painting to be taken out and put in the in Institute for Contemporary Culture, which is upstairs where the main body of the show was. So at that point, I realized that uh, it really was a painter's duel and, uh, between Miss Chief and, and Paul Kane. Now, Paul Kane is 
or was a Toronto-based painter, and his house, uh, incidentally, is uh, at the corner of Church and Wellesley, which is our, our gay village, <laughs> and uh, it's still there. Um, so here in this scene, I I had Miss Chief, who has obviously come and toppled over his easel and walking away rather indignantly, and um, so what I did when we hung the work, I had text from Paul Kane's journal next to his painting, which essentially uh, he was complaining about how far he had to travel from the city of <laughs> Toronto to find authentic subjects that weren't somehow you know, Europeanized. Meanwhile, we had, of course, there were Aboriginal people in, in the city of York at that time. And Miss Chief on her side said, I have presented myself repeatedly to Paul King. He refuses to paint my portrait, and I have the latest fashions from Paris, <laughs> and I don't understand. So, um, so here I sort of yeah, implicated these other men with the mass as well as Paul King. And it was based on uh, this painting by Jerome, the, the, the duel after the masquerade. And as you can see, the victor has got this, uh, is either dressed like a native person or is a native person. So I thought that was kind of remarkable and worth uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, using as inspiration for that piece. Um, so the, the, the exhibition at the Royal Ontario Museum ran for six months. So the, the curators, in their devious little way, uh, brilliant way, said, well, we want you to do a performance and can you do something so, well, I know exactly what I'll do. I'll respond to being censored from the First People's Gallery. So, right there in that corner, uh, right behind where the stage was, was the First People's Gallery. And this is in the atrium of the Royal Ontario Museum. And um, so it took the form of a seance. So, uh, she came out in this fabulous outfit um, with a regular sized headdress and um, called up uh, Delacroix. She said, I want to talk about pain. So the, 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 the seance was really a conversation about painting. And the questions that she asked the painters were basically all the same questions. What are your thoughts on color? How do you choose your subject? And so forth. And they all responded from their own journals in their own voice. And I had actors off uh, stage who were the disembodied ghost voices of, the, of Delacroix, Paul Kane, and George Catlin. And while that was going on, there were projections on the wall of the different artists, as well as images from their paintings. So uh, three grand entrances were made with overtures and uh, dry ice and the whole bit between each artist. And the headdress getting bigger. Um, and this was Paul Kane, who had absolutely no problem cross-dressing himself when, when he felt like it, as did uh, George Catlin. And she finally makes her final appearance. She has this headdress, which is uh, a mile long, and uh, she's had in conversation with uh, George Catlin, who also had no problem cross-dressing when he felt like it. But, um, so here she has this ridiculously long headdress, and the idea was, of course, the stretching of truth and the, uh, the, loose, the looseness or extension of, of truth and, and subjectivity of, of storytelling, tall tales. Um, so um, at the end of the piece, she really takes George Catlin to task about his quotes uh, about the uh, bear dash, and she asks him pointedly. What are your thoughts on the Verdash? And he says, well, I think it's one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen, and I wish for it to be extinguished forever. So at that moment, the music starts, and she's like, well, we're going to bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these three uh, guys that I've collaborated with before, they're actually uh, dancers in Shooting Geronimo, um, were in the audience. They jump out, they tear off their shirts, and uh, so begins this uh, kind of um, dance to Miss Chief, uh, I had a piece of music commissioned for this piece, which is uh, Miss Chief's club hit. <laughs> <laughs> and it has since been remixed, and there's a video now, uh, which I recently finished, 
Um, so the, the, the piece just kind of ended in the celebration of this dance uh, piece, which was uh, a lot of fun and really kind of made great use of the, um, the lobby of the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, so as my show, uh, I, so I developed this show, Triumph of Mischief, and it toured, and um, so I, I also wanted to um, bring kind of um, create spaces inside these museums, uh, great uh, Aboriginal space. So I thought about how to do that with using, based on the teepees. So I created these teepees, which really function as movie theaters, and um, this is called Teatro Cristal, and it's made of string and beads, and it's very glamorous, it's, it's very mischief. And uh, all the text on the wall there is um, based on, it's all writings from, based on Catelyn's journals, but it's in Miss, she, she's sort of turned it around, and it's her own observations of the European male. Uh, and there's, the three films are projected in the teepees, uh, the three uh, Super 8 films. Uh, in this case, it's projected down from the chandelier, there's a projector in the chandelier, and you can see the film projected again on the, the bison hide, which is this receptacle history and storytelling. And they're transparent, so you can really be inside the teepee and experience the paintings uh, in, in the different galleries. I had to version the teepee, uh, a truncated version, to, to fit inside these uh, museums, because often, you know, we're confined by 12 or 15 foot ceilings, and the teepees are typically 30 feet tall, so I, I built these versions that would still sort of feel like teepees, but uh, that could fit, and they actually gave me the wrong measurements in that gallery, we had to poke holes in the ceiling. <laughs> for that piece. Um, and this is the inside of that teepee, which is um, called Boudoir de Verdash. And uh, you can come in inside and see this two-channel version of uh, shooting Geronimo. And she's got her little magic clay bears chasing the cowboys there. And uh, you can see there's her presence is there. So when I thought about this and creating this, I was thinking again about museums and dioramas and how they uh, have been used to, you know, create these uh, time capsule ideas about um, cultures, including Aboriginal cultures. So there's no actual figure here, but uh, I'll show you another piece later that explores the, the, the diorama a little bit further. So uh, this is a, a still from uh, Dance to the Bear Dash. Uh, some of you might have seen it uh, here in Montreal. Um, and again, it was based on the, the Catlin painting, which I uh, kind of took that live performance a step further and made a five-channel video piece in which uh, four dancers, four male dancers, uh, projected onto four hides, surround the central hide, which is Miss Chief, and they dance to her. So, and there's various sort of interludes in, in, in the piece. The music is uh, kind of a mashup of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring this ex exploration of the primitive, primitivism. And when I collaborated with the, the choreographer, my friend of mine, Michael Gray, I said, Prince Creed, uh, I said, we really, let's refute this idea of our cultures being primitive. And um, so the men, the male dancers, I incorporated these elements of dandyism, the, the, the parasol, the top hats. Again, I was like, you know, bringing these European elements and kind of mixing them with uh, the, the Aboriginal leggings, which are PVC in this case, but uh, um, Catelyn in, in, um, in one of the villages, well, he described that as actually seeing them everywhere, but he's the, he called them dandies, they were the flamboyant men of the tribe, and uh, they would spend their whole day just working on their outfits, and they, they weren't warriors or hunters, they, they weren't out there, you know, killing bear or bison, but they would just find any little rat rabbits, bunny rabbits, or things they could easily catch and turn them into these fabulous outfits. <laughs> so I ended up uh, creating a series of, uh, of paintings uh, about the dandy, kind of imagining who the dandy, the Aboriginal dandy was, as these flamboyant, beautiful gentlemen with uh, very fashion forward. So in this piece, uh, I kind of designed these uh, outfits to be this mashup of European and, and Aboriginal um, fashion. So I've used fashion and the idea of fashion quite a bit in my work as this signifier of cultural change and influence that crosses culture and how we borrow ideas uh, about how we dress uh, from each other. Here's an installation picture from uh, inside the Montreal Museum. <clears throat>
and it's um, it's big enough that you can really walk around it and experience it from different angles. The rear projection, so you can uh, see it from different sides. This is a painting that I did um, for uh, one of the one of the, the venues on the tour was the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and I'm from Winnipeg. I grew up there, and my father's family is Cree from Manitoba. And, Again, I, I think uh, I, I did Saturday morning art classes at the Winnipeg Art Gallery and it really was this place of wonder, wonderment for me and a place of learning and uh, also a place where I, I felt I belonged but didn't belong. And, um, so the history of uh, my great-grandmother's people were that they were relocated three times. Uh, moved from St. Peter's, which is just north of the Winnipeg area. and. Uh, government uh, had made an agreement with them which was ultimately uh, not honored and uh, as you know settlers you know, arrived more and more and more of them arrived uh, demand for the land increased and um, that community was disbanded and moved and broken up and people were pushed off to different locations and um, so uh, that happened three times uh, within her lifetime and eventually she's went and homesteaded off reserve in a community on Lake Winnipeg and um, she, because of the, the land that ultimately was uh, finally given to uh, our nation is uh, a swampy kind of not very attractive piece of land I would say. so a lot of people didn't want to live there my great grandmother included so I wanted to do a piece that uh, spoke about that about the dispossession of our, our people from that uh, had been promised to us. And um, I thought of, uh, I've used biblical allegories, and there are biblical allegories in this show. Uh, I like biblical allegories because it really speaks to the impact of Christianity and how Christianity has been part of this colonial process for trying to get Aboriginal people to accept Christianity. But there's also so many great stories about uh, that have all the all the, the necessary components of high drama, and uh, in this case, it was uh, uh, Lot and his family being expelled from Sodom. And really, the moral of this tale, aside from leaving a place of uh, a lot of fun, um, was that you are not supposed to look back. You're not supposed to. Look back. So Lot's wife turned and looked back. So we're not supposed to have uh, a memory. We're not. We're supposed to forget that we were pushed off. That the place that maybe the agreements that we signed off on don't exist anymore. So it's really about this erasure, this amnesia that we are supposed to have about the past. And a lot of my work really is again refuting this idea of this sort of collective amnesia that has been imparted to us through um, this process, but also through modernity, which again really uh, has been about uh, a deliberate or willful amnesia. And, uh, and I, I think that I've, I've really embraced painting, pre-modernist painting, to, to under, underscore that idea that um, it's okay to have, uh, to have a relationship with the past, it's okay to have memory, and that cultural memory is actually really valuable. Um, so here, Miss Chief is, the, um, is Lot's wife, and she's been turned into a pillar of salt, the most glamorous pillar of salt. And uh, so I looked at uh, various things in the, in the museum collection, and uh, there are these three women from Ganawage by Suzer Cote, which is a bronze sculpture that is, uh, you can find it in different museums. And then there were some watercolors by Rindisbacher, who was a, a local uh, Manitoba. He was Swiss, but lived in Manitoba, and he made these paintings of this, this Métis family here. And, uh, and then I found various pictures, uh, paintings of the fort, uh, lower, lower Fort Gary, which uh, is just south of uh, St. Peter's. Some of them were not really that great paintings, but I just thought, uh, you know, they, they kind of, uh, I asked for them to, uh, you know, to show some of them during my show so that they're, again, I could engage with the museum collection and somehow activate the museum collection to get people to think about differently about uh, the received histories that we get from from museums, which are often in a very um, straightforward, linear fashion, and often from this 
tradition of, of storytelling or framing history, which is very European. This is a painting called uh, The Academy, and um, uh, in 2008 I was uh, commissioned by the Art Gallery of Ontario to create a painting for their new installation in the new Gary building, and um, they were reinstalling their Canadian galleries, and Gerald McMaster is the curator of Canadian art. Um, was selecting objects and images to put in uh, these galleries, which they had uh, developed the themes of power, uh, power relationships. So I, I was delighted to have the opportunity again to go into the museum and have the freedom to uh, find whatever I could in the AGO collection. And I, I, I don't really like to look. You know, I, I mean, I've had pe some people kind of invite me and they, they, they just want me to look at the content, like the Paul Kane paintings, and I tell them that I kind of like to look at everything. Um, and uh, so this painting really is, uh, draws influence from a number of different sources, but uh, essentially it's this, uh, this idea of the, uh, the lodge as this place uh, uh, that represents Aboriginal worldview, I guess, it's circular. Um, and so I turned it into Miss Chief as the master artist, and this is her atelier, and she has her, her, her students uh, with her. Now, um, I'll just go through some of the, uh, oops. Oh yeah, well here's the painting by, by Catelyn of, of this gentleman, and you can see the before and after, and I, uh, I don't know why that's there, but. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a, a, a painting by, uh, uh, it's called Zeuxis Choosing His Models, and it's a terrible reproduction. The actual painting is, is very beautiful, and it's in the Art Gallery of Ontario, and it was sort of one of the foundation paintings for, uh, for, for the Academy, because it was about this idea of selection, about idealism, you know. And I, I saw Catelyn as kind of having, you know, made, made the same choices about, you know, his, his models, and how his models had to be this idea of pure, cultural purity. He really didn't want to paint um, you know, aboriginals that they weren't sort of somehow suiting his ideal. Um, so here the, the, the artist extrapolated the, the, the best qualities of, of these uh, five female models. And then I also looked at this, uh, um, this was not in the AGO collection, but I, so yeah, I, I didn't restrict uh, my influences to only what was in the collection, but this is uh, something that was done by one of uh, David's uh, students, and I was just kind of struck by uh, the, um, how gay the scene was. <laughs> uh, the male models and all these men sort of pressed in there tightly, and uh, so that was part of what uh, shaped my thinking for what Mischief Studio would be like. Um, and this is a, a painting um, uh, from the 19th century. Uh, I'm just blanking on the name of the artist, but it was one of the artists of that period who, who again, was making images of, of Native people. So I got influence there. And then uh, this um, Aboriginal man here in, in the Benjamin West painting, of course, made it into my uh, painting because he seemed to have this the pose of the thinker by Rodin, and I like that idea of you know just Aboriginal thought and um, philosophy, I guess you could say. This was um, the founder of the Grange in which the AGO is is built on, um, and his name is Henry Bolton, and this portrait hangs just in the gallery, just outside of where my painting is installed. So you kind of, as you walk in, you can kind of pick up on these subtle uh, inclusions. And this is with his wife, Harriet Bolton, and this chief is kind of masquerading as Harriet Bolton in, in the painting. Uh, and this pot is in the painting, and this pot is actually made by that, uh, the, the Zuni Verdash, uh, Wewa, that I showed you the picture of, you know, who was also a master potter. Of course, uh, Leo Kuhn, a classical sculpture that um, I chose um, all, partly because of the, the serpent, which I, the snake theme kept coming uh, up in, in various things. So the, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but the, uh, the Aboriginal man there has these incredible snake uh, 
tattoos on his body. And I only realized that after I made the choice, but um, this is um, Castor and Pollux, uh, a bronze sculpture in the AGO collection. This is an Edenshaw pole, which was in the same room as my painting. This is Rodin, this is Adam, which is at the AGO. Haida mask in the same room. These are both in the same room. This is Norval Morisot. There was a Morisot painting in the AGO uh, room. This, this one um, was not in the room, but it, I think it's in the collection. There's a close-up. You can see the snake tattoos. Paul Peel. <laughs> Paul Peel was at, was at the AGO, and I, I turned these into sort of these um, I guess cupids. So this is uh, uh, the most one of the most recent pieces that I, I, I've uh, created, which is a diorama. And uh, this was just installed uh, at uh, Plugin, and it's part of a, a group show called Close Encounters. Winnipeg was nominated Cultural Capital of Canada for 2011. So uh, Anthony Kingdale at Plugin. Uh, invited four Aboriginal curators to create essentially this, this massive, almost biennale, or survey of contemporary uh, Indigenous art from around the world. It's a very exciting show. It's up for six months. If you get a chance, it's a fantastic show. Very strong work. Actually, it's one, well, one of the best group shows I've seen, not to be biased, but uh, group shows sometimes are uneven, and this one seems to be largely very strong. Um, so. Um, the original idea was for me to do something at the Manitoba Museum. And the Winnipeg Art Gallery and the Manitoba Museum, because I was, you know, went to these museums as a kid, were both sort of uh, inspirational and scarring. Um, and the Manitoba Museum was great, a place of great fascination for me as well, because uh, they had dioramas, like life-size dioramas of uh, you know, Indians in the forest and Indians hunting buffalo and stuff. So I would kind of go in and obsess about those, and my imagination would go kind of wild on, on those. And so the original idea was to go in and populate. They have this urban village, which is kind of like in the 19th century. Uh, it's a life scale, life scale. You can walk through this little town. And I wanted to populate that whole town with um, mannequins that had my face on them. And that idea came from my visit to the Museum of Natural History in New York in which all of their mannequins representing all the nations of North and South America, male or female, <laughs> old or young, all have the same face. <laughs> it's this sort of generic, high cheekbone male face. And I thought, that's interesting. We all look the same. <laughs> so I wanted to populate the urban village with these little girls with blonde hair who would all have my massive face on them. But uh, in the end, they said, no, oh, I wonder why. <laughs> but uh, so I was shot out of the Manitoba Museum, and uh, so I decided to do a diorama uh, at Plugin. So instead of a, a, a natural environment, because you know you think Indians, we always live in the bush. Um, I put Miss Chief, who is now she's getting a little on in years, <laughs> um, into this. Parisian apartment, um, and uh, I was thinking about the aging diva, where you know, like Maria Callas. I really was thinking about Maria Callas, who, you know, after her prime and her, she had destroyed her voice, and Onassis had dumped her for uh, Jackie Kennedy, and she was alone in her apartment, and she would listen to her own records. And I thought, oh, that was so, so sad. So here's Miss G, all alone in her Parisian apartment, listening to her one-hit single, Dance to Miss Chief. <laughs> and uh, the, so you don't actually hear the music, but uh, there's six channels of audio. And, uh, and so what I did instead was to have the natural world encroaching in on her apartment, as though it's, well, we're not sure whether it's her, her memory or whether it's really happening, but uh, so this is a view from, there's a mezzanine, and you kind of, you can see down through um, through this branch, and there's these uh, ravens perched up on the branch. So there's ravens in the soundscape. Uh, down in the diorama, there's a beaver, and he's chewing away on the leg of the record table, the record player. Um, the record's going round and round, and you can just—it's just the scratching sound of the record. 
um, there's a coyote which is kind of lurking through through the the, um, the apartment there. It's really rep to represent just the corner of an apartment. And there's the sound of a ticking clock, the passage of time. And she's looking out through this window, and these photographs don't really tell the story very well, but uh, uh, there's a, one of my paintings uh, through the window. So she's kind of gazing out at this landscape of, her, of, of the past and um, reflecting on her past life as a new, nubile young Bergash. <laughs> and uh, she's crying. Her mascara's running, and, and lately Miss Chief has been crying a lot. I don't know why. <laughs> But uh, her mascara is always running, and she's been she was crying in another recent painting. Um, so we cast my face uh, and put it on this this mannequin, and that was uh, I'd never done that before, and that was really pretty brutal. And uh, when the when the, after an hour and a half, this thing finally came off, it was like stuck to me in various places, including you know hair and eye eyelashes and <laughs> stuff kind of ripped off. And I had this giant suction bruise on my nose that stayed for three weeks, but ultimately it was worth it. <laughs> and um, so here, uh, we fitted it with the pump, so it actually cries real tears. About once every minute, there's a trickle of tears. So as you go around the back and look back through the window, it's no longer a window, it's a picture frame. So it's framed like a portrait, and the opening is much smaller from the back. So it's really uh, kind of a portrait or a self-portrait. When you get around the back, the back. Is that the end? that's the end, I guess. Of that. Uh, yeah. um, so, uh, how are we doing for time? Do we have time to have one more quick video? Uh, yeah? Okay. I just wanted to show uh, one last piece, which is not really uh, uh, museum related. It's um, it's just a, a, a live performance that I did at, um, at, at Nuit Blanche in Toronto. And, uh, um, it was an opportunity to kind of uh, engage with uh, uh, a location in the city. Uh, there's a park in Yorkville that has uh, basically a giant piece of the Canadian Shield that was cut up. It's like 650. I don't know how many tons it is, but it's massive. And this rock is part of this park. And the park was actually themed as this Victorian idea about collecting for these gardens. So um, I uh, uh, just pause for a second. So I, I wanted to uh, turn that uh, rock into a feeding heart, um, which was essentially to kind of bring back or get people to think about you know, these places which are now extremely urban, but were once were, you know, were, were different kinds of places. Um, and the, uh, the sound, of course, you won't get a full impact of the sound here, but um, we had these massive uh, subwoofers um, brought out into the streets, so the impact of the sound was really uh, very strong in terms of the bass frequencies were uh, really tremendous, and so we uh, look at this. Oh, and one of the other things that I do when I, when I um, get performance footage like this, I, I tend to sort of embellish it. As you notice with the taxonomy of your female, there was this sort of BBC voiceover. So um, it's usually a little, there's, um, well, let's just say that the crowd really loves me. <laughs>
Start. Um, ultimately, uh, we were only able to do that. About six, I did that about six times, and we were shut down for being too loud. <laughs> and we launched, of course, it's supposed to go all night, but we shut us down at 11. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, that's it. I'm happy to take any questions or anything like that. Special projects with them. Um, they've shown my work. They've collected some of my work, but uh, no special projects yet. I'd love to. Do you think it's useful to have the term Aboriginal artist, or should we just be talking about Canadian artists? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, I think. Uh, Maybe Canadian artists or just contemporary artists is better. Um, I think it's a process of, um, I think it, it's really different for every artist and I think how you sort of define yourself. Um, I think we do, uh, it, is, it is problematic when we, um, um, we, we are defined um, by uh, the outside. I think when we choose to create our own exhibitions about our, ourselves and our communities, I think that's really quite different. Um, and it's an opportunity to uh, really um, reflect and examine uh, similarities and differences uh, within our own communities. And I think those conversations are, are really important, as important as they are uh, in terms of, you know, having conversations with the world. And I think I was always, you know, taught that I'm a citizen of the world, and uh, you know, my it was very kind of uh, frustrating, I think, for my family because they wanted to participate in the world, and they were relocated. And I think, um, you know, you have you had Victorian, you had these villages of Victorian people, uh, in, in native people living in these Victorian. Villages. And Alan Easter Bompson has made a film about it, but um, you know, relocated uh, well after you know, contact, well after uh, you know, the Aboriginal people have been you know, basically participating in the world. And um, so I think it's, uh, but I think there's a lot of conversations that have to happen about um, being very specific uh, about who we are and where we're from. And like I said, I think a large part of it has to do with education find myself, you know, in that role sometimes just because some people don't know. And, you know, at the same time, I'm learning as well. So, um, so I think those are, they're all good conversations, they're all valuable conversations, and um, they, you know, we need to have them. What about in terms of um, queer or gay or two-spiritedness? How does that like factor into that sort of identity, like naming as? Do you name as like I well, I, Yeah, I. I mean, I. Again, it's like these are labels that are often come from outside, and I think uh, when I think about it, it's like I, I wouldn't only want to be in uh, you know some kind of queer context, and I wouldn't only want to show my work in, in an Aboriginal context, and uh, I think that both of those can become uh, problematic. Um, but at the same time, I don't limit or limit how I the subject matter. I don't try and stay away from you know things. I just try and I'm trying to be uh, true to who I am, and um, 
I hope that I can find universalities that will speak to people beyond you know, these communities. That we're, you know, and I, I, I'm hoping that, that that's what's happening with my work. Um, that there are uh, themes and messages that um, you don't, you know, you're not queer or Aboriginal, and you still find interest in work. I'm curious about the lengthy, or what seems like a lengthy time consuming detailed process of observation with um, your paintings and the selection and the appropriation and reappropriation of images. And I'm wondering whether in that process, whether you learn something more about the images that you select. Uh, yeah, often I, I do, like I, I, like I said, I, I kind of s sometimes stumble across things uh, as I'm already in progress, like the, the snake tattoos on that, on that painting, and um, um, you know, it's always a discovery process when I, especially if I go into a museum and I had the opportunity with the McCord to actually go in and just start pulling out the drawers myself, and that was amazing, so you can you know, very quickly just kind of, you know, um, discover a lot. Um, so that kind of thing happens uh, all the time, and um, uh, there's probably a number of examples. Um, one thing that happened here with this show was, uh, I mean, at first I'd seen the Mary Magdalene painting at the Museum of Art, and I loved it and wanted to somehow engage with it, but, uh, you know, the reproduction that I had of it, you know, in my studio <laughs> was about that big, it was in their catalog, so I couldn't see all the details, you know, that were in the painting. And then when it was actually here, like the day before the show opened, I, I saw that some of the jewelry, you know, in the bottom corner are actually the same sort of teardrop shape as the earrings that are in the, the show here. And um, that, that was kind of a, a nice discovery that's, that happens, you know, well into the, the process. Just in the same vein, I'm just wondering if you ever are curious to watch people watching your work. Um, or the process of observation for the viewer because there's so many layers and so much information and the fact that you do performance has, that has a prescribed sort of duration is one thing, but then in front of a painting, I wonder if you ever sort of are curious about how people interact with your work. Um, yeah, I am, and I've had the opportunity once or twice. I, I generally um, don't do that because I think it's a bit creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm desperate. Um, you know, uh, when uh, the Triumph of Mischief opened uh, at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, I was in the gallery um, with the photographer documenting the show, and so I did have the opportunity, and this was pretty early on, but the, you know, that was the first venue for the show, and so people were coming, it was during gallery hours, and people were coming in, and um, I, I just, I was kind of amazed, this elderly couple came in, and they spent an hour and a half in the gallery with my work. They sat in front of those two big paintings for a half an hour each and just had this back and forth conversation pointing and talking and that went on and on. <laughs> so I was I was kind of amazed by that. But uh, often I'm not there when the work uh, is, is viewed. And, um, but uh, I know that uh, people have told me that they've, you know, especially the painting at the AGO when it gathers or um, generates quite a bit of discussion from people. So I've, I've heard things kind of secondhand. Here. Hi, Candid Scowanani back here. Hi. Um, I'm just amazed at your use of materials. Now, I, I've known your work for quite a long time, and I remember when you did those prayer, uh, the prayer paintings, I can't remember what they're called, you know, but with the, the pre-syllabics on them, and you, you had developed an entire technique of painting, and then I remember when you started doing these, these historical paintings, and film, dioramas, uh, you know, uh, installation and performance. I'm just, when, how, how are you doing this? Like, do you have a clone? <laughs> you know, I mean, so like the question, yeah, it's, it's kind of a nuts and bolts type question. I, I think you're a genius, by the way, <laughs> and an inspiration, but I, I, I just, would love a little insight into how you make that happen, and, you know, um, and I know you must have, a, yeah, I, I can keep asking the question, but I think it's there. Thank you. Um, I was a painter for a few years before I, 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 I kind of 
broke out and started you know, investigating other mediums, but it, re it was really came out of a desire to collaborate with people. And um, I, so I get a lot in my work is through collaboration, through working with some really brilliant people. I have to say, it's not all me. It's um, I've I've had like you know people like Michael Grayeyes, Giselle Gordon, who is a filmmaking collaborator of mine, and uh, I consistently work with the same people over and over again, and then new people all the time. But um, I love actors, I love performers, and um, I just find my work you know in composers, and I I, I get I get it through collaboration with some really brilliant people, and so they make me look good. Mm -hmm. And uh, the video piece here, I, I have to confess. Thank you, Michelle, for kind of pushing me. <laughs> but I was so overwhelmed with the, the amount of work I still had to do on the paintings and uh, running out of time. And I was like, I can't do the video, Michelle. I, uh, and she's like, oh, come on, come on, I need the video. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I have worked with the same people consistently and uh, I've done a number of short films and videos. Um, so, um, that piece came together quite quickly because I was able to call my peeps and just say, are you available next Sunday? <laughs> and uh, they all said yes. My key people all said yes. My makeup person, very important. She's <laughs> Make it, it's getting more challenging for her now that Miss Chief is aging. But, um, <laughs> and then my cinematographer, who uh, also had the bigger challenge because like, there's close-ups this time, girls, you know. You know they're going to be in their tights, so they really had to, you know, rent some extra lights and blast it with light. And, uh, but that video was um, really inspired by shampoo commercials. Uh, again, the theme that runs through this, one of the themes that runs through the show is hair. And um, so I was looking at these shampoo commercials in the slow motion with the hair and the glamour. Um, so that's the look I wanted. And, and I knew that my people, like Jackie, she's amazing makeup artist, she could pull it off, the cinematographer would be able to pull it off, and so it's about working with the best people you can find, and uh, we're going to work together. <laughs> when I look at uh, the work you've done and, and with institutions like museums, and, uh, and it seems to me that the museums of fine arts uh, are more um, open to um, your pro. I mean, risk-taking with you, in, in the sense that they seem to have a capacity to be self-reflexive that history museums don't have. Because I'm thinking of the what happened at the Rom, and then you mentioned that the Manitoba Museum wasn't interested in, which, which seems, you know, kind of mind-boggling that they're not willing to address those issues. Um, and I'm wondering if you have anything to say about that. Cause it's, is it because there's a contemporary curatorial you know, there's specific curators that are, you know, have that critical dimension and bring that to those museums, or? I think that's part of it, that the, uh, the curators are kind of just more uh, attuned to, um, you know, these conversations that happen more often in contemporary art, but these, these other institutions are often uh, bogged down by people who've been in the same job for 20 years. So these museums are, it, it really is about people who, who kind of like uh, hold these positions for 20, 25 years. Like the gentleman at the Royal Ontario Museum, he's been there, like Paul Kane really is his whole life. And I think, I mean, I, I felt kind of sorry for him in a way, because it's like, uh, I, I, I like Paul Kane. It's not like I don't like Paul Kane. I just want to, you know, I want us to be able to have a conversation with Paul Kane. But um, I think it has to do with the personnel and the way those museums uh, Get these people who are kind of locked into these jobs for 20 years, and so everything moves very slowly. And this, it's I think it's even worse maybe in the states because I, I've, uh, there's there, there's people at some of these museums in the states uh, that are, are are really they have a stranglehold almost on on, on especially in the ethnographic uh, departments, um, which make it very difficult for. Uh, and, and, and yet there's there like I'm thinking of the National Museum of American Indian. You know they have a film festival. But when you, I, I actually boycott that film festival. I just stop <laughs> participating in it because they, they treat you like a specimen, and it's weird. Like there's no crossover with, you know, contemporary art world. And they're in New York, they're in Manhattan, and you just feel like you're being trotted out like some kind of uh, specimen. So 
some of the museums are really problematic. But what's been the fallout in, in Toronto with what happened in Iran? For, because, I mean, I can't imagine that being constructive in, in the long term for them. <laughs> um, I know it went up, like it, that, 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 that sort of incident went all the way up to Thorsell, who was the director at the time, and he, he deferred to his, uh, his, his staff member and, and allowed that to happen, and, and he's still there, but Thorsell has moved on, so I don't know if there has been any sort of movement there, um, but it, it, uh, it basically means that I still have a job. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Thanks. I noticed in your two paintings, uh, the old painting and the Mount Calm painting, that Miss Chief is wearing uh, sure. her woven hair earrings that are, to my mind, very British and very uh, Victorian. And she's wearing a choker that's a, an Aboriginal piece, also a hair piece. And I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about the two divergent symbols, like the British and the native elements, and also just about hair and, and the choice of the hair pieces. Um, well, again, you know, Miss Chief is sort of very, she's very fashion forward, so she's always uh, interested in the latest European fashion, and um, so I, I think that, you know, that's just a statement about, you know, what my work is about, it's about, you know, kind of breaking down these you know, divisions between um, Aboriginal and European, and the fact that we've been here for hundreds of years in conversation, living together, sleeping together, um, fighting, Negotiating, and um, so I think it's it's kind of more interesting to to have these uh, intersections. Uh, and like I said, fashion is really a great place to start. It's, uh, it's it's our outward appearance. It's how we define ourselves and what we wear. Um, the hair theme. I guess I had a, a kind of a, a slight uh, idea. I had some ideas for paintings in the back of my mind, but as I actually went through the McCord. And I started to find those, you know, those prints of you know, the royal family, and and then I started going through these drawers and just finding these incredible things made out of hair, you know, and they're kind of beautiful and creepy, and um, so I, I was just kind of that kind of decided, really determined through my visit that it was going to be based on hair, and then I started thinking about hair as power, and you cut hair, you cut power. So that you know, kind of inspired the Samson and Delilah allegories, and then um, the Mary Magdalene, the hair washing, washing Christ's feet. This idea of her so much love for him and surrender, and and then that sort of you know inspired the painting as well as the video. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, just two two things. When you're referring to uh, you know these these curators who don't. That you access. Um, do you think that a lot of the time they're actually in love with that work? And, oh, absolutely. And they see you as the defacer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I know that was the case at the ROM. Like he, he, he makes pilgrimages to um, these rapids, like in Northern Ontario, that are in Paul Kane's paintings. I mean, he, he, he's a Paul Kane fanatic. I respect that, though. Like, like I said, I think that's um, amazing. You know, I just, I just felt kind of sad that. More people can't appreciate Paul Kane and, and, and maybe in a different way because he's he's still relevant, you know. And um, like that's what was sort of strange in my mind is that he's not. It's not like I'm trying to deface him or defame him. It's really about just continuing to have a, maybe new conversations about his work. The other thing was just having the title Miss Chief. Um, uh, is access often given to you because the curator or the audience is more in love with you or more in love with her? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I can't answer that. You'd have to ask the curators. I don't know. They're in love with both. So They're in both, both thank both. you. <laughs> about that detail, uh, is a mother, a native woman who's a mother. 
and uh, I'm not sure what she's doing, and I'm not sure why she's there. Well, uh, often people have asked me, uh, why aren't there any women in your paintings? Um, <laughs> so, um, I don't know, I like men, but uh, I do like women too. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that woman, uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right, Sacagawea, she accompanied Lewis and Clark, she was pregnant at the time, and it was because of her that they survived many different incidents along the way. She was kind of a guide, and she uh, negotiated and translated, and she was kind of like saved their butts, um, you know, in a number of different ways, but all of this while being pregnant. And uh, I think she might have even had her baby like on that, one of those trips or something. It was just like this incredible person that um, helped them. And, not as well known that maybe as, as, as she should be. Is that what you mean? She's on the dollar coin in the United States, so I have to say that. Oh, there you go. <laughs>